Signal Hill was offered a million dollars to uh, buy a building and to ho- uh, to house single mothers who had just had babies, you know, so to kind of do this. And they're in kind of that pro-life movement space. You know, this was several years ago and they ended up having to wrestle with that decision. Before we go any further, I want to introduce myself and our hosts and explain a little bit about how we joined this larger conversation on ministry and marketing. We're an agency just outside of Vancouver, British Columbia, that started in 2011 with the conviction to help churches and ministries share the gospel with innovation and creativity. The goal of our agency in this audio podcast series is to help faith-based organizations unlock their potential using tools like brand strategy, communication planning, design, and digital experiences. Since then, we've got the chance to work alongside incredible organizations all over the world. Joining me is our Director of Integrated Marketing, Pat Padley, and Lead Consultant, J.M. Boyd. I'm Jason Jensen, CEO and Director of Strategy, and we're so glad you're listening. Now back to the show. What does it take for an organization or a ministry to figure out how to make that decision? Let me clarify. They said no to the million dollars? Yeah, well, yeah. you ruined the punchline, but ah, sorry. they said no to it, and they actually ended up feeling great about it. Great. And so I uh, want to talk through that, and like, how did they get to feeling great about saying no to a million dollars, where um, that is big for them. You know, like, they're not, they're not a massive ministry, so a, a million dollar donation or something into something would be massive. Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing is... Uh, and we we face this example a little bit is you're doing a rebrand or a refresh or a new website and it could be a, a, a church or a diocese or um, a ministry with lots of divisions or something and everyone is saying hey I want my spot on the homepage and you get into the scenario where how do we choose how to handle that scenario. Do we try to keep everyone happy? Do we, um, what, how do we make a bold decision? How do we say no to certain things? And what do we say yes to in order to further things forward? So what do you guys think of that, those examples? Oh man, I love the Signal Hill example. I just, I can't even imagine as an individual, if someone offered me a million dollars, how you say no to it or why you would say no to it. But it's, uh, it's probably my own personal pain. That'd be really hard. Yeah. But you're saying they have this freedom about them, which is when, like when you said that, that's the thing that resonates so much for me is the freedom to say no Mm -hmm. (laughs) to a million dollars. And the freedom for them comes with total clarity and alignment that this is who we are, this is who we aren't. And don't get me wrong, like my understanding of how that happened was somebody said, hey, you guys are, you guys are killing it in a great way. Mm-hmm. I want, I, you know, like I, I know real estate, I can get a great deal on a building, and I love uh, being able to support single, single mothers, that's like a passion, you guys are in that kind of space already, um, you guys do this. And for them to say, oh, we're honored that you, you feel you're so highly, you know, if you think so highly about us, but who we are, you know, their why, so that's what we're going to be talking about, why brand promise and brand story, um, they're, all of those things, that, that project didn't align with it. And they knew that if they, if they said, if we say yes to this, it's going to, divert our focus it's gonna it's gonna dilute our effectiveness and it's gonna be much harder we're gonna have to hire somebody we're gonna have to like figure out how to do this whole thing and it's somebody else's to do not ours and so when they when they had the language and the freedom to be able to get there that's when they (laughs) it's just it becomes so obvious so so yeah. how do you get that? How do you get that kind of clarity is, is part of what we're going to talk about today, right? Yeah, I think we, all, we always, like we're passionate about starting with why in a, what we call brand foundation, which so let's unpack what a brand foundation is. And um, brand is not design. It's not um, colors. It's not 
you know, only the creative parts. Yes, those are, but those are actually way less important things about brand. Uh, they're, they're not as close to the core as when we think about why you exist, what's the brand promise that you want to have, what's your brand story, how you operate, what's your culture, all those kinds of things. And I think brand is a, is a term that we are borrowing from the world of marketing, but the way we approach that at Glass Canvas is thinking through it as what do spirit-filled brands do? How do we integrate really solid practices um, and integrate that into faith, the world of faith and spirituality and asking ourselves, like, what is the Lord doing? And so our, our Brian Foundation in particular, we're trying to figure that out and help ministries discern that really well mm -hmm. so that we can figure out what that is. And the idea of a brand foundation, the foundational part is it's this core part of uh, the organization that, that this is, these are the most important things. And if you get them all right, you, you end up with clarity and you end up with alignment so that you know that every single thing that anyone in your organization is doing is pushing your organization forward in the right way. By by going through and defining all these elements, there's multiple elements other than the ones we're going to talk about today that make up a brand foundation, but it's these are the bricks that lay clarity, that, that provide clarity mm -hmm. uh, for the foundation of your brand. Or if you think about it, it's actually the, the foundation of which you can build great ministry mm. upon. So what you do is built up upon all of these things what you do is also part of like the whole brand foundation it's like from why to that social post or that event or that conversation that you're having with with somebody every activity should be built out from this foundation or built up from this foundation okay so little cliche but yeah um i've found myself like saying when i'm trying to explain why this is so important to uh, different pieces like you can you can use different analogies but one of them is just explaining that why is sort of the keystone right if you're thinking about like an arch or a structure everything sort of falls apart or or is it you know doesn't lock into place until you have the keystone element right in the middle of it that's sort of brown foundation or that's the why that why is the central point of that that then starts mm -hmm. shaping everything together making it look like what it's supposed to look like the, the most important thing that we're trying to say is these are the most essential things to figure out in order to know that everything in your organization is pushing you forward. I think that's when we think of brand foundation, we're making sure that you're not doing something that's outside of this, this key part that is your foundation. Can I flip back before we go on to brand and mm -hmm. just a definition a little more about that? Cause I, I find myself saying this, I use like a variation of what Jeff Bezos from Amazon said, which is the, your brand is what uh, other people say about you, mm -hmm. or you know, when you're not in the room. That's right? what he yeah, says. Yeah. yeah, it's what other people say about you when you're not in the room, and the role of sort of this alignment and clarity around communications or around your structure is is to get other people to say what you need them to say about you when you're not in the room, mm -hmm. and the so understanding why you exist, this sort of keystone element starts locking everything else into place, but. Help me, help me. Well, I think just maybe build off of that. I feel like what you struggle and what you hear people when you when you talk to them about brand mm -hmm. is brand can be this like oh they for think some reason there's a negative or, or and sometimes there's images. a negative uh, feeling about the word brand. It's such a marketing or it's loaded it's term, worldly and doesn't apply to or it references of faith. in their mind branding, which is the verb. It's the action. It's, it's of the it. elements, yeah, right. the visual elements. Whereas, or, like when when I'm explaining it to someone, they say, "Well, yeah, no, we've got a logo, and we've got like a language package, or different things." It's no; those are tools of a brand to get people to say what you want them to say about you. They're not the brand in itself. Like if you're defining the brand, you have to start with your why. A, a simple analogy that we break down is a brand is the whole person, and who people think that person to be, you know, that's an analogy. When we talk about branding, you know, or design, like that's like, he's wearing a cool shirt and he likes wearing sunglasses and he vapes in a small town in Fort Lane. Sorry. Call him out. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, James, our local vape guy. But I think it's more about saying, Hey, like those, like your clothes you wear and like the language that you use, 
Um, those express your personality. A person is not what they wear. A person is what their character is deep down inside. Um, and yes, f impressions make, make a big difference, but yeah, so that's, I think what we mean by brand is, um, kind of the relationships that you have with other people and what people would say about you is like, Hey, Pat's a great guy. And you know, he has a beard. No, but it's also, I think like when I was describing it to a client recently, so I used the Jeff Bezos line, you know, your brand is what other people say about you when you're not in the room. But I think particularly for ministries, I think there's also the, how is the Lord actively working within your organization? Um, which we'll get into brand story a bit later, but I think what is, what is, what's unique about your organization? So let's, let's dig into it. Let's dig into more about. Yeah. So if we're thinking piece. of, yeah, where do we start with brand foundation? It has to be why, you know, why do you exist? And I think when we ask this question of why, um, yeah, it's important. It's important. We're thinking about it from a faith perspective and we're asking the question, why has the Holy Spirit blessed this organization or these group of individuals in order for something to uh, a part of the kingdom to be expressed in the world. So when working this kind of faith based space, um, everyone, when we say, Hey, what's your why? Everyone will kind of go to this, the biggest why possible, which is some version of, uh, to be fully alive is one we hear a lot, uh, to build the kingdom, to go make disciples of all nations, go, Matthew 28. Right. Yep. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, proclaim Jesus or uh, like some sort of expression Be of a those. part of the new evangelization. And, oh, and, yeah. and none of those are wrong. Those are all absolutely true that those are part of somebody's why. The difference is that we believe that particular parts of the kingdom, the body that you're describing the whole body of Christ, you are not describing, Hey, I am a hand or I am a foot you're not describing your handness or your footness. And I think that, you know, that's the part where we say, okay, if you can find out what God has called and anointed you to be in that, in that space, then man, fruit, we see fruitfulness happen when we see people living that out, calling that out and then living it out. So that's the kind of why, but to give, um, Pat, you've got this. You got this NASA one that you love telling. Why well, did you jump into that? Yeah, I mean, when for me, why um, kind of came on the scene as a tool when Simon Sinek's book came out in two thousand nine, and he gave the big TED talk and kind of made the rounds. And um, and so I read the book, and the story that that I think best describes the alignment that you're talking about is JFK is walking through NASA, and um, you know he's taking a tour and. Um, and he sees a janitor and the janitor's, you know, cleaning the floor, or bombing the floor, or whatever. And he goes up to the janitor, you know, just this presidential thing and, you know, wants to shake hands and kiss babies and all the things that presidents do and, uh, goes and meets the janitor and he says, Oh, what is it that you do here? And the janitor says, I help put a man on the moon. And that's, that's alignment. That's clarity. That's the kind of, uh, uh, understanding of what an organization is trying to do and how my role, even if it is just mopping the floor or, or cleaning up or whatever, I understand how I am a piece of something larger, which is when we talk about actually creating a why there is an inspirational element for me. There's an inspiration of, uh, that, that, that your why should help people take action towards something. It's not a goal, but it is something that helps people, inspires people, um, inspires people to get up at, you know, at, uh, um, out of bed in the morning, those right. kind of things. Like Simon's definition of, uh, why is, why is the purpose, the cause or the belief that drives every organization or every person? It's like you said, why you get up in the morning. Um, yeah, it's why anyone should care. Right. And, and I think it's, um, the language of calling it why is, is new. Yeah. I do think it's that come out, but I think that this idea is deeply baked into and ingrained within us as people is to operate at this level. Um, we, you automatically very quickly get a sense if somebody is in part of your tribe or not. And I think that that is, that's been the same, um, um, way for, I think that's who we are as social beings. And I also think that 
it's difficult to name why. So part of part of like as we unpack why, it's something that has to be discerned, and it has to be something that we put language to, that gets there has to be a stickiness to the to this, and it also has to resonate on an emotional level. Um, but you see that it because it's coming from like the limbic system or like the center part of your brain, and it's not coming from that's the part that says you you know we belong in the same team or tribe or um, we're, we're like, we're the same. Um, that's also the part that lights up when we get it right. If we can name our why, it's like, yes. You let know, me, like, that's why I get out of bed in the morning. Let me go into that in a second, or just for a moment, is your, um, you, have, you everyone's got these experiences where they just say, oh yeah, this is, this feels right. Or it's almost easier to spot the ones where you just say, oh, that just doesn't feel like us, or that doesn't feel like me. And that, but you can't put words to it. That's literally because that emotion is connected, you know, call it your why or call it your reason for existence, whatever it is, that's connected to a deep part of your brain. Jason mentioned it, the limbic system, which is the emotional core of your brain. And the interesting part is that has no connection with the language centers of your brain. So you can't actually put words to it. You have emotion around it. You have feeling around it. So you can start saying things or talking about things, but you can't almost when it's at that emotional, when it hits that emotional part of your brain, you don't remember saying those exact words. It's, it's part of the reason you can't just define your why yourself. You have to do it in a community. You have to do it in with help, well, it's, uh, a it's third really, party. Yeah, it's really difficult to do because you're stuck in this curse of knowledge of like... You know too well, too much about yourself. And, and there's too much shop talk and like right. all that kind of stuff. And the other part is uh, it's... Um, yeah, the curse of the curse of knowledge that kind of kicks in, and you, I, I would say, if you worked long and hard enough, you could maybe stumble upon it. Sure, but to have somebody reflect on it is so much easier. That's a lot quicker to be able to ask you questions that kind of un- unpack. Well, this, the this longer part. you work in anything, you start to use your own words. We do it here all the time. We have to stop ourselves and go, okay, no, this is what we mean by brand, or this is what we mean mm-hmm. by this, because we just get into habits. Yeah, and we do that. We do that within the faith world as well, where. This is why it's so easy to just reflect back on the whole of like, no, our, our mission is to, uh, you know, to bring the gospel to every person or to build the kingdom of God. It's so easy to just rely on that umbrella. Why? Uh, for and just define our organization based on that. Because, but, uh, yeah, we've heard it being articulated a lot. Exactly. Of, and it's true because we nest underneath that each of our each of us as individuals or as organizations sort of come underneath that why and it re- yeah it resonates yeah i think the other thing when we're thinking of discerning why is like what is not a why yeah so a why is not a mission statement or a vision statement or a goal sometimes a goal a, a why can be disguised in a goal like mm-hmm. putting a man on the moon but i think that baked in the putting a man on the moon why that resonated so much is because it had all this, we're in an, we're in an arms, we're in the space race, you know, and it's, uh, we're all oriented towards this like national pride of with, you know, by the end of the, before the end of the decade, we want to put somebody on the moon. Um, so there's, it, it can sound sometimes like a mission statement or a vision right. statement or a goal, but I feel like it is not those things. It is something deeper than those things. And those things, if they resonate, they should inform. Um, but to say we want a million people who are engaged with that, those are, those are goals that, right. They're not, not necessarily, um, they're, they're not why statements and getting to that. Here's the hard part is oftentimes a mission statement or vision mission statement in particular with a faith-based organization sounds so close to a why. And it Mm -hmm. is, it's really close. But what's like, even I, I struggle with this, what defines a why from a mission statement like a lot of people have gone through a process to define a mission statement but how do you like uh for me a mission statement you there's certain things you can't do with it it's more what would the fruit that comes from a mission statement is different than the fruit that comes from a why i i think some people have put amazing effort into mission statements and they guide their organization forward so yeah that's really a case-by-case answer if you know to be put kind of on the spot there I think that if you go, 
a why has to be really sticky. Somebody has to say, they should be able to hear your why once and be able to regurgitate it to you two weeks later without having to think too long and hard about right. it. Right. And if you can if you can apply your mission statement to any other organization where by changing one word here or there, like it's probably not a why because your yeah. why is unique to you, right? It has to be unique to you. And the discernment process is, it's, it can't, it's never cookie cutter. Right. You can't just say, hey, fill out this form and we can, we'll tell you what your why is or... Um, it's a wrestling with something. Sure. So to find out it's, and that's discernment's the same way. I mean, there's, there's four characteristics of a why that are sort of the boundaries or rules. Uh, one is simple and clear. This is part of that stickiness part. Uh, one is actionable, meaning it, it's gotta be something that it drives. It something drives. Forward. Yeah. And then, yeah. um, it's focused on how you contribute. So to others or to something. It doesn't have to build that into it in the words, but it has to be sort of alluding to it. Yeah, there's some sort of transcendence that comes. It's not, you know, profit can never be a why. Yeah. Because it's, um, it's it doesn't have this transcendent quality of um, fulfilling the, the, the greatest right. purpose that's that we The ex- fourth one yeah. there is like, it has to resonate with you, mm-hmm. but that's the one that's harder to... You know, that's the part that you're never going to get from a form or filling right. out a going through a program it, to define why something is resonating with you. You could write it in positive, affirmative language and it would feel, mm-hmm. but you, you got to be able to recognize when it causes an emotional reaction with you, within yeah. yourself or within your team. Why is this so helpful to define your why? Well, is there like, let's maybe we could pull out a couple examples. Let, let me let me jump into the Signal Hill example. So, sure. So, uh, and their why is to value every person, and so that example doesn't necessarily va- like um, do that. But what um, their brand promise, which is kind of the other side of the coin, which kind of gives you a start of a of of the filter, is to discover you matter, and so. Value every person is absolutely, we should value single mothers um, in a difficult scenario. So that doesn't necessarily value that. But the brand promise is also baked on like the hows, which we'll be getting into in in an episode um, soon. But those things together help them say, oh, yeah, this, this doesn't violate value every person, but it's not quite aligned to, if we were to do this, we need to do this with our brand promise. And it feels like that's, discerning this through our brand promises like oh there's some signs that this is not the right question for the right thing so, so is it a little too much to talk about our brand promise yeah i think let's go for it okay so well we mentioned it in the in the in- intro there's like our, our brand promise is to unlock ministry potential right um the uh what that forces us to do is actually evaluate every person on our team every department on our team to say how are they unlocking ministry potential? And if they're not, how do we shift that so that they are? Or should we be doing it in the first place? Yeah, and it's not necessarily that we're evaluating every person. It's what every person is here to do. Sure. In the same way the janitor is saying, hey, I'm going to put a person, you know, right. put a man on the moon. Um, yeah, so let me, let me put a definition real quick yeah. to brand promise. Because mm-hmm. I feel like we unpacked why. Sure. So brand promise, <clears throat> the way that I describe it is, it's the value or experience that an organization um, that the that they want their audience to expect and receive from them. So where I feel like why is kind of this this there's this core who we are like why do we exist what's our reason for being uh, a, a brand promise is it's about something that must be kept within every touch point and every interaction mm-hmm. with with your audience. So um, for me the filters when you're when you're coming up with it it's. Um, from the marketing lens, does it convey, uh, sorry, convey a compelling benefit? Um, and is it authentic or credible? Like, is it always true? Mm-hmm. And then is it kept every time? And particularly those last two, I feel like are good filters that allow you to kind of think through what, what your brand promise is. So if we go back to ours, uh, unlock ministry potential. Jason, like how does a developer, <laughs> how yeah. does a developer unlock ministry potential? Yeah, I think um, A, he, he's like when we're thinking through how how are we strategically going to approach a project or what 
um, what tools are there available for me to use, or even how am I going to structure this code? They have to think in the terms of um, how do I steward the budget well? How do I um, how do I do what's right for the end user so that it's not just checking a box? Um, and so if, if you think of like, hey, I know that we have we can do this now that'll set them up to be able to do this later. And in any part of an organization, in every person's life, how you approach your work has nuance. And you're making thousands of micro decisions that are difficult to, you, uh, uh, if we had to document them all, we would just never, no one would ever get something done. So we need these kind of guiding principles in order to say, oh, even they're asking themselves the question, is this right? And right is defined by the brand promise in that scenario. Another interesting way to go about this is let's talk about, um, we've been talking about Disney recently. So um, can you? Uh, yeah. So, yeah. So I've got a few examples here. So um, we can talk through Disney and Ikea. So Disney, I really love this. This is kind of my favorite example. Disney's brand promise is uh, creating happiness through magical experiences. So, um, like it's been in the news, Disney's is going to be, you know, releasing their streaming service. They've got parks, they have movies, they own ABC. They own Marvel. They actually, yeah, I think now they own like a portion of Hulu even like, mm. and, um, they're gigantic. But when you think about all their touch points, um, everything that they do is around this idea of happiness through magical experiences. So even if you go to the Disney park, we were kind of talking about this before, uh, you throw something away and then it's just like, it's like magically gone. Like, like, uh, uh, there is somebody who comes and picks up the trash, but you will almost never see them because they have these like behind the scenes, like tunnels and things that like, there's sort of like these secret employee areas that they don't want to break like the, the fourth wall, if you will, of the mm -hmm. experience. Uh, because they, again, think of their brand promise creating happiness through magical experiences. It's all around the experience. Yeah. So literally, uh, Disneyland, I just looked this up when we were talking about it before. You throw something in the garbage can, no one no one comes and picks up that garbage bag. There's no garbage bag. It goes underneath. It's a oh, shoe no underneath that gets picked up unseen. <laughs> wow. wow. So you never see someone coming and hauling garbage away. Mm -hmm. and, and they know that they have to go to that kind of effort because if somebody comes and picks up the trash and they're wearing like overalls or something along those lines, they know that it changes the experience. It changes you. Yeah. You're breaking the fourth wall and you're risking that magical experience being ruined in the same way. We hear these like horror stories about how you're not allowed to take off like your Mickey mouse costume, even if it's super hot and things like that. But they, they understand the importance of not wrecking that child's, um, it's magical because they believe it's real. Mm -hmm. right. So they don't want to break that. And um, even the language that they use for uh, people who are the characters in the park, and they actually do have street sweepers, but there would be street sweepers that would be consistent with the character on that. So right. if you imagine, like okay, dancing like dancing around, sort of doing like Mary Poppins style street, sweep, street sweeping. Exactly. So, um, but they call, they don't, you don't um, go to an interview, you go to an audition. They call them, hey, you're auditioning for a role. this role because you're part of putting on an experience. Mm -hmm. You're not part of getting a job done. So I think that everything that they do is oriented around that. Um, the other example is, uh, have you guys heard of the wristband mm -hmm. thing? Yeah. So uh, I'm not sure exactly how it works, but they invested billions of dollars in like this wristband technology so that you literally you get these wristbands and when you book through disney your plane lands your luggage automatically magically appears in your room the shuttle experience is amazing um you don't have to like stop and pick up tickets or anything it's all around the wristband that gets you into the rides and all that kind of stuff so they've tried to eliminate any barrier to feeling like it's not a different unique amazing experience the, the wristbands are called magic bands by the way nice <laughs> with, with rfids in them or whatever yeah and, and and i don't know i just think that's so cool and you can see it in every touch point so as an example so they're going to come out with the streaming service they've announced that already what even in the whatever the user interface 
of that new streaming service should be. I'm, I'm searching for, you know, my kiddos to watch Toy Story or whatever. It needs to be a magical experience. Uh, let's, un- let's look at another one. So Ikea, uh, a brand that a lot of us love, um, to create a better everyday life for the many people. So there's, this, there's a little bit of uh, idea here of around um, democratizing style. I think um, the the whole better everyday life, like just making something accessible uh, to to people, um, and they do it in in so many ways. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I feel like even when designers get their projects, they have these added challenges of saying it has to be able to be ship in a box that is this way, and we're going to ask our clients to like build the furniture. Um, themselves and if you think about it everyone else has that opportunity to do that as well but they don't Um, but so they've said look we're gonna design really great stuff and part of the democratization is we're gonna get you to assemble it yourself which can be frustrating well I mean (laughs) there's even other aspects you ever walk into an Ikea and they're not it's not just buy the stuff right it's like why would they have like I know their restaurants are uh, they're a break even they don't they're, make they lose money off. No, they I'm pretty lose sure they money. lose money yeah yeah but they do it if you think about their brand promise it's what is it again exactly uh, to create a better everyday life for the many people it makes sense right you you're going shopping you're spending time and then you can sit down and have a plate of meatballs and yeah I actually Lincoln heard Berry. that um, they they found out that when people were hungry they didn't buy as much. So, so it's like, unlike uh, me at the grocery store when you know, I'm hungry, you so, buy everything. So they didn't want people to like sacrifice on that. So that's an interesting one to think through how that actually meets their brand promise. But I feel like even the experience of that is, um, yeah, they're giving you like some sort of, we can debate if it's quality food or not, but, um, in a streamlined way in order for it to service as many people as possible. But it makes an every, you know, makes a uh, better life for me on a, it's a lot easier to bring kids to, to bring Ikea. Your kids, absolutely. A, you can mm-hmm. drop them off and they can play in the ball pit and then you can do your shopping and then you can pick them up and have lunch and then go home. Yeah. You don't have to worry about making dinner when you get home or whatever it might be. Or how about the return policy? The yeah. return policy is 365 days. You know, they just launched a campaign last year that said, you got 60 days to return it, no questions asked, because sometimes you stop loving it. It was some, some mm. language around that where um, it wasn't even... Uh, oh, it didn't work. Or it didn't broke. work because I stopped just loving like, it. That's, that's awesome. Mm. I, I wanted to switch back to our brand promise. The question about developers, one of the things, the scenarios I thought about is is unlocking ministry potential developers got to think through that i mean it's really basic and easy to see how it would apply to strategy or how it would apply to content development or marketing developers is a tricky one but we're literally asking our developers to look at you know not just hey is this how could you do this as cheap as possible you know sometimes there's they would rather use a certain tool because they like using that tool but they know to unlock ministry potential they don't need to use this big tool. They can just use this simpler tool. Or sometimes it's the reverse of that, where they know that this client's going to want to build something on top of that later, and they don't want to start from scratch again. So to unlock their potential, it'd really be about saying, you know, we've had these arguments before and sort of going, mm-hmm. hey, they're going to want to do that. This is down the road. It's going to cost them more later if we don't do this now, even though it's more you know, there's a quick way to do it and a cheap way to do it right now, or we can put a little more effort in mm-hmm. up front. Mm-hmm. Let's move to to brand story. I feel like we have why and brand promise, which why is kind of that internal, like what's, what's that thing that resonates? The brand promise is sort of the external experience of that why. And then the brand story is kind of how we talk about and engage with that. And one of my favorite examples of this is, uh, an organization called charity water and they're pretty high profile. Um, if you haven't, haven't heard of them, you should definitely check out their website. I think it's charitywater.org. And wherever you kind of start engaging with them, you're going to hear the, the story of the founder, Scott Harrison. And he's going to say, I was a nightclub promoter and 
I, you know, I came to this point where I felt uh, physically bankrupt, morally bankrupt, spiritually bankrupt, and I knew I needed a change. So I signed up for, um, to do this mission trip on, uh, mercy ships and I paid them to do it because everyone else rejected me except for them because, <laughs> um, and he went as a photographer and what mercy ships does, which is a totally not, it's not his organization. It's a different charity. Uh, they fly, oh, sorry, they on a ship, they have like doctors or things come to a port, um, say in Africa, and then people will come from thousands of kilometers to get facial, like facial reconstructive surgery or like to remove a tumor from their face. And, um, and he saw, wow, there's just, there's way more people here than, than these doctors are going to be able to service. Like that is a tragedy. So one day he ends up going off ship and just walking around and he sees the, this woman drawing water from kind of like a swamp. And he's like, wow, they have to drink that. Like that just it struck him so deeply as being an avoidable crisis. And he's like, no wonder, um, uh, these people are struggling with their health because the water is, um, the, what they're drinking is not sanitary. So he said, I, um, if we can fix that, we can, we can eliminate so many of these other things. And so his heart just goes to water. And that's where you say like, you know, their why is expressed all over the place. It's like water changes everything. And so you see him like raising money and, and all that. And as a, as a brand, they're really great in that they kind of sit between the donor and the local hero who's actually doing the drilling. And they're, they're making sure that that's that. But the powerful part is how clearly they've been able to articulate their brand story and how that shows how it aligns to everything in their organization. And because it's story, you just want to, you jump in there and you're like, yeah, of course that makes a massive difference. Um, but yeah, um, brand story is a, is a, is a powerful tool. One of the things, I mean, your brand story is, uh, part of it, exploring that is really good. Sometimes we forget where we come from or we use the rote version that we you know, print up all the time instead of actually going, okay, well, what actually happened in the founder's life or this group of people that got them to where, what are the elements where the Holy Spirit started like um, really showing fruit or whatever you want to say, started highlighting things for them of where opening doors for them to go through. With back to the charity water example, one of the amazing things is how many people, yeah, they say it everywhere, but I know so many people who can, within some frame, recollect that story. And I think part of that is because they align with it, right? The Your brand story helps you define your why. So when we're help walking someone through defining a why, we often, at some point, we'll, you know, we'll walk through different uh, methods and different things, but then we'll bring their brand story in. Mm -hmm. And we'll focus particular attention on these moments of growth where it seems like the spirit did something and then there was this new depth and breadth to the ministry and saying what happened there like mm -hmm. that that is an expression of why you exist and what you like the the particular expressions of the spirit were in your organization that we should be very diligent in listening to and being careful with and like what was that fruit let's name it okay when you started doing x we saw powerful movement of the spirit. And I think if we tie all these things kind of together, it's like, that's why brand promise, brand story. We're really asking this bigger question of what is God doing and how can we double down on doing more of that? Right. So, and it, it tells us why, you know, why we're in this role, what our part of the kingdom is to build. Mm -hmm. So give me, um, when you're talking to a client and they're saying, ah, but we've kind of done the mission vision thing. We've done why, like, tell me how this is actually going to be practically helpful because I feel like that's sometimes a struggle. Yeah. What do you, what would, how would you, what, what would you say? Um, well, oftentimes I'll explain that um, like a goal is something great to have if you want to develop some kind of strategy to achieve something, right? You, you um, need goals you to do, develop You strategy. absolutely do. And we'll go into more of that later, but um, your mission statement is is a little bit of a rallying cry, but why is your alignment point? It's the tip of the spear, right? It's the it's the point you set and you draw everything 
you, you know, start pointing everything towards that. It's really difficult, uh, you know, from a creative aspect, if you talk to a designer, if you just give them a mission statement, they can't design towards that. If you give them a why, they can design towards it. They feel it so they can put, they can replicate that in visuals or in tone and language for, uh, you know, a copywriter or something like that. You can't do that with a mission statement. So why is sort of a tool that allows you to unlock content development, allows you to unlock communication strategy and all these other pieces. That's one element. The other element is what why does for you as an organization around building culture and stuff. And I know we're going to go more into that in another episode, but it sometimes it's the, it's the unspoken things. Uh, uh, we, everyone I've talked to almost across the board has a moment in their organization where they recognized there was an opportunity, like this $1 million opportunity that Signal Hill had, where they had the opportunity, this, a good idea came up, and there's thousands of good ideas that are going to help build the kingdom. But is it ours to do, or is it someone else's to do? Is it going to help push our goal forward, or our, our what we've set out to achieve forward, or is it not? And you have to have a why. You have to understand your brand promise. You have to remember your brand story in order to make sure you've got, you know, that's the start of the filter. We'll go more into filter later. Yeah, I think the, the other thing, um, my last thought is, why does this all work? Why does this all make sense? And it's, it's rooted in even the idea of a company, like is actually, hey, we're having company over. Like, I think it's the, the group of people or if you think of an organization, it's how we as people are organized around an idea. And like, why is like, hey, there's this thing that's resonating with all of us to do this thing. We exist to do this thing so that we can see this change in the world. Or um, this is our brand promise, which is actually the best part of me living the truest part of ourselves. Like the people, um, it's, it's the idea of having integrity, like a diamond is strong from you know all sides if it's well cut. Um, and it's brand story, it's us. It's us doing this thing together and people joining into that kind of um, movement of, of where we're going. So yeah, the takeaway for me on, on this, this episode of, um, is that these things take work to kind of get to and they take discernment and it's not something that just happens. You can't just put a couple hours aside. Um, but every minute that you spend trying to figure these things out is worth, uh, is worth the effort. It's been great. That was awesome. Hey everyone. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, you can subscribe and learn more on our website, glasscanvas.io. We're so grateful that you could join us. To everyone out there working hard to build the kingdom, keep doing work that matters. This show is produced by Gareth Alexander with music by Jonathan Velasquez. Curious about any examples or resources discussed on the show? Check out the show notes for more info.